We're going to get back into Hebrews tonight. It isn't the sound of the shofar. That just makes my skin tingle to hear that. But uh, when you read in the Old Testament, that was the ram's horn that they would blow, and there were several uh, different instances that they would blow to assemble the people. They would blow the shofar. Well, what's going to happen at the rapture? God's going to assemble his people. And it's also a sound of war. And not only are we called up, but God declares war on a Christ-rejecting world. And the tribulation period begins, and the plagues of God are poured out. So, again, I don't know if the rapture will take place this week or this month, but uh, if it does, I hope you're ready. I hope you're prepared for that day to come. And uh, somebody, I'm thinking about working on a sermon entitled, What to Do if You're Left Behind. What to do if you're left behind. I'm going to have to work on that because a lot of people are going to be left behind. They might need to know what they need to do then. Tonight we're going to look at the New Covenant, Hebrews chapter 8. The New Covenant was made by the Lord Jesus prior to his death at Jerusalem. It was made with 12 apostles who represented the house of Israel and also the foundation of the New Testament church. It became the fulfillment of all previous covenants. Now, if you've been here for some time, uh, especially my Wednesday night class, not too long ago, we had a study on the different covenants that God has made with mankind. Do we have that chart? We've got a chart of the covenants that uh, we can look at. And this is the covenants God has made with Israel. There was actually two covenants before this. Before the Abrahamic covenant, back this way, God had made a covenant with Adam. We call it the Adamic covenant. Later on, he made a covenant with Noah. After the flood, God made a Noahic covenant. He promised he would not destroy the world anymore by flood. And there were some other conditions involved in the Noahic flood. But Abraham's covenant begins the covenants with Israel. Israel being the descendants of Abraham. So there was an Abrahamic covenant. There was a Mosaic covenant that God made with them as they were leaving Egypt and going into the land of promise. Then with King David, there was uh, another covenant made that God would make a covenant with David and his house and uh, the throne of David would always have a descendant of David until Christ comes, who is also a descendant of David. So Christ will fulfill all these covenants, which he has, and brings in a new covenant, which we're going to talk about tonight. We are under that new covenant that God has made as Jesus Christ being the mediator. Moses was the, Abraham was the mediator of that one, Moses of another one, David, but Christ is the mediator of the new covenant that was made with Israel. And I'm going to show you how we, as a Gentile church, we have been grafted into that and enjoy the spiritual uh, blessings of that covenant. So Christ came to bring redemption, to fulfill all these covenant promises that God made with our forefathers, after three and a half years of miraculous ministry, he confirmed the covenants of redemption by dying on the cross, redeeming us from sin. But Israel as a nation rejected Jesus. Now many Jews got saved, but the religious leaders and the, the entire nation of Israel rejected the Lord Jesus as their Messiah. The Sanhedrin condemned him and had him crucified. God extended grace to Israel for 40 more years. From the time of the cross till A.D. 70, it was about 40 years. God gave them that space to repent and trust Jesus as their Messiah. When they failed to do so in A.D. 70, God through the Romans judged Israel, Jerusalem, the temple was destroyed. The Jews were dispersed throughout the world. 
A people without a country, without a temple, without a priesthood. All that was taken away. But there is a new covenant that is in effect and will finally be ratified with Israel when Christ Jesus returns in glory. Look at chapter 8 with me, verse 1. Now other things which we have spoken, this is the Son. We have such a high priest, we've been talking about Jesus as our high priest after the order of Melchizedek, not after the order of Aaron. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man, Jesus, have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. Now when Christ was on earth, he did not serve as a priest. He did not function as a priest. That did not come about until after he had made his sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. Verse 5 says, Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern shown to thee in the mount. So what we're finding out is that tabernacle that Moses and the Israelites made was a pattern of one that was already in heaven. There is now a temple in heaven. And one day, uh, New Jerusalem is going to come down upon a new earth after the millennial kingdom. So there is this tabernacle on earth. Now the first point I want you to see is that Christ is the minister in a better tabernacle. A better tabernacle. First of all, note where he sits. The Lord Jesus sits in a place of majesty. He sits at the right hand of the throne of God. Now remember in the Old Testament, the priests would go in and out of the temple to perform their duties. There were no chairs in the temple or tabernacle. There was no place for them to sit down, right? Because their work was never finished. Now the idea that the Lord Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of God is telling us something. It tells us that Jesus finished his work. When he died on the cross and he shed his blood, and he sprinkled that blood upon the mercy seat in the true tabernacle in heaven, he sat down. He was finished. There was nothing more to do. One sacrifice forever for all. Now, as I said, in Bible days, the Israeli Supreme Court was known as the Sanhedrin. The high priest presided over the Sanhedrin court. When he was presiding in court, to his left and to his right were scribes. They would write out the verdicts that the court was handing down. If someone was guilty as charged, the terms of his prosecution were written out by the scribe on the left. If he was acquitted, it was written out by the scribe on the right, at the right hand. You see this? Where's Jesus seated? At the right hand of the throne in heaven. There, as the God-man, as our brother, our Lord and Savior, he's in a place of authority. He has written out the terms of the acquittal of our sins. Our sins have been forgiven and they are held against us no more. That's the significance. And the Jew would understand him being seated on the right hand, what that meant. Now, 
the high priest could not go into the Holy of Holies and sit on the mercy seat. There was a seat there, but it was not for anybody to sit on. The mercy seat was the throne of God. God would come down to that place, and that represented the presence of God and heaven. So the high priest, if he, went, if he would go in there and sit on the mercy seat, that would be a blasphemous, wouldn't it? But guess what the Antichrist is going to do? I told you this morning that he is going to have a temple rebuilt in Jerusalem, and when they get it finished and get everything in place, he will go in to the Holy of Holies. Maybe he will sit on the mercy seat. He'll bring the TV cameras in and declare himself to be God. That's why it's called the abomination of desolation. An abomination that makes the temple desolate in the eyes of God. That's not yet happened, but one day it will. God has said that it will. So our high priest is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we said in Hebrews, what are we in learning? That everything we have in Christ is better. The priesthood is better. The tabernacle is better. The sacrifice is better. Uh, everything about it in this new, co this new covenant is better than any covenant that came before it. He's seated in a better tabernacle. That's where he sits. Secondly, note where he serves. And it is a place of ministry. This is, first of all, the true place. It is a place, a true place of ministry. We come back to the theme of the tabernacle and its spiritual significance. We're going to learn more about that in chapter 9. We get more about the temple and what it represents and the true temple in heaven today. But in Jesus, we have these spiritual realities. Now, understand that in the Old Testament, you've got shadows. In the New Testament, you've got substance. Which would you rather have, the shadow or the substance? Shadow's not worth much, is it? Everything in the Old Testament was really a shadow of things to come. You might look at, at the corner of a building, and somebody's going to come around that, but his shadow may come first. Before you see the substance of the person, you see his shadow first, if the sun's behind him. The shadow's not the person, is it? There were things in the Old Testament that were meant to be a shadow telling us of something of substance that will come. And in the coming of Christ, he fulfilled these types that we find in the Old Testament. Hey, folks, that's why it's futile for people to try to go back under the Old Testament law. You've got people today trying to keep the Sabbath, right? Seventh-day Adventists. Do you know they're Seventh-day Baptists? You ever heard of them? I met one once. Seventh-day Baptists who worship on Saturday, the Sabbath day given to Israel. They're, try, they're trying to go back under the law and keep these. Some try to keep the dietary law that God gave to Israel. Folks, God does not expect us to do that. That was the shadow. We have the substance. I mean, why walk in the shadows when you can walk in the sunshine? Unless it's 100 degrees out, then you're looking for shade. Amen? But that's a different illustration. So it's a typical place. In other words, it is a type of something to come. The Old Testament priest ministered in the model, but Christ ministers in the true tabernacle or temple in heaven. You understand that? Folks, listen. All these things that God gave to Israel, they are worthless without Christ. Without Christ coming to fulfill these things, it means nothing. It's all meaningless if divorced from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in the Old Testament, 
I said Moses was the mediator of the covenant God made with Israel. Aaron was appointed high priest. His sons would follow him, serving as high priest of Israel. Now, before this, before Moses and Aaron, when they were in Egypt, several hundred years in Egyptian bondage, right? Did they have a priesthood in Egypt? You're like this. No priesthood. Now, the Egyptians had a pagan priesthood, but the Israelites had no priesthood. Up until the time of Moses, the patriarch served as the priest of the family. Abraham was the priest of his family as the patriarch. That was passed on to, to Jacob and Joseph and the others. But now, God makes a covenant with Israel and he makes Aaron, he ordains Aaron to be the high priest. And the, the, the Levites would be the priests under him. So this was new. Something new. But it was still a type of that which is to come. Israel was redeemed and set apart by the blood of the covenant. But they rejected their Messiah. Right? When Jesus finally came, when he died on the cross and his blood was shed, the Bible says without the shedding of blood is no remission of sin. There must be a blood atonement. And yet Israel rejected their Messiah. Therefore, God had to set them aside. And he has worked through the New Testament church to carry out the kingdom purposes. It was the church that would take the gospel into all the world. Souls would be saved and baptized and brought into these churches. Now in the last days, God is once again about to work through Israel. But to do that, he will remove the church. The church age, when it's finished, the church has completed her work. It will be taken away, set aside, will be raptured out. And God will once again focus on Israel. We talked about that this morning. That 70th week, that seven-year period, is the time of Jacob's trouble or Israel's trouble. Remember, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Sometimes the Bible swings back and forth using Jacob and Israel, referring to the same people. So God saves us from our sins, as we are and where we are. He saves us from our sins. He sets us apart for himself. He gives us access to himself. We can enter in, in prayer, folks, we can enter into the Holy of Holies. We can go through the veil where God is on his throne and Christ is seated at his right hand. And in prayer, we can approach God and petition him. I've told you, you are a believer priest. Christ is your high priest. You're a believer priest, which means you have the right to approach the throne of God. You have free access. The Bible says, boldly come before the throne of God. Come with confidence that he will hear you. So these provisions at Calvary provided us with a Savior who is preeminent and a better security. Second, I want you to think about Christ as the mediator of a better testament. Christ the mediator of a better testament. Let's continue reading with verse 6. Read down through the end of the chapter. Verse 6, But now hath he or obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant or testament, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for a second. For finding fault with him, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers 
in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they continued not in that covenant. And I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind. I will write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. They shall not teach every man his neighbor, every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. And that he saith, A new covenant he hath made the first old, now that which decayeth and wax old is ready to vanish away. So this is telling us Christ is the mediator of this new covenant, which is a better testament. First of all, it is an improved covenant. It is an improved covenant. We looked at the covenants that you read about in the Bible. You know, the Bible is divided into two divisions, right? You've got the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. We say Old Testament, New Testament. You could say Old Covenant, New Covenant. Same thing. We are under the New Covenant. And it's better than the Old. And it has a better mediator because the mediator is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Now when you read about some of the covenants, some of them were conditional and temporary. There were certain conditions Israel had to, to obey in order to receive the blessings of the covenant. God had told them, if you will obey my commandments, I will bless your land. If you disobey my commandments, I will send a curse upon your land. That's a condition, right? That is a conditional covenant. It was based upon the condition of Israel obeying the terms of that covenant. And when you read about that in Exodus chapter 19, and Moses brings this to them, they say in verse 8, this is what the people said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do. Amen. I guess that's not going to be so hard. We can do this. Lord, whatever you say, we'll do it. Maybe a little presumption involved there. Because they didn't do it. Nobody has ever kept the commandments of God's word. You have not done it and I have not done it. The law was meant to show us we need a Savior. We can't keep the law. Nobody, only Jesus Christ has kept the law perfectly. He's the only person who's ever lived on this earth that lived without sin. So we've got a new covenant. In contrast to the old, and provides a much better security than the old could ever do. Those, those Israelites that told Moses, yeah, we'll do this. We'll, we'll keep this. What did they do after that? They turned right around and made a golden calf. One thing God said is don't make any engraven images. They turned right around and made one. They made a golden calf and said, this be the God that delivered us from bondage. You know where they got that idea? In Egypt, the Egyptians, pagans, worshipped many gods. One of the chief gods of the Egyptians was Apis. He was the bull god. That's where they got the idea. The golden calf was Apis, the bull god, a chief god in Egypt. A god that the Lord Jehovah defeated. Jehovah defeated all the gods of Egypt, didn't he? And for them to come out of Egypt and say, Yes, Lord, we will keep everything you tell us to do. And they turn right around and make an image and say, This is our god. Now, I'm not just pointing fingers at that generation because every generation afterwards has been just like it. 
Our generation is just as bad. But we have an improved covenant in which God has assumed all the commitments. This is an unconditional covenant. God has taken upon himself all the commitment to fulfill the terms of this covenant. The only condition facing us is accepting Christ as our Savior. That's it. That's all we have to do is accept the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. Trust in Him alone for our salvation. In doing so, we enter into this new covenant. We enter into the kingdom of God. Not only is it an approved covenant, but verses 7 and 8 tell us it's an imperative covenant. It was imperative for two reasons. Imperative, it means that it's something we needed. We needed it, first of all, because the old covenant was faulty. Not so much faulty in itself, but faulty in the sense that there's no way we could ever keep the law to save ourselves. And that's what people are trying to do. When Jesus came in the first century, the religious leaders were leading the people in an attempt to keep the law for salvation. And that's what Jesus had to deal with. They were trying to keep the law of Moses to save themselves and have a, a home in heaven. And he had to deal with that. That self-righteousness. The old covenant was faulty because it was never meant to put away our sins. The law was meant to show that you're a sinner, not to put away your sin. Everybody get this, because this is important. The law was never meant to put away your sin. It was to show you you're a sinner. We cannot keep it. Just take the Ten Commandments. There's not a person here that's kept the Ten Commandments. Amen. Don't look past at me. You haven't, and I haven't. We lie, we steal, we take God's name in vain. OMG. Do you know that's taking God's name in vain? I mean, you don't have to say the bad stuff. Anytime you use God's name lightly, you've taken it in vain. And we've all been guilty of that. We need the law. It served its purpose because it pointed us to a Savior. You know what a yardstick is? A yardstick can tell you how tall you are, but it cannot make you any taller. Amen. Is that right? The law can show you what is wrong, but it cannot give you the power to change. There's no power in the law to transform us. That came through Jesus Christ. So the old law, the old covenant was faulty, and therefore a new covenant was promised. I want you to go with me to Jeremiah chapter 31. And let me show you way back in the days of Jeremiah that God promised a new covenant that would come through the Messiah to the house of Israel. Jeremiah 31, look at verse 31. It says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand. Does this sound familiar? We just read this in Hebrews, didn't we? You'd be amazed how often the New Testament writers were quoting the Old Testament. You'd be amazed. How much of the New Testament is quoting the Old Testament? So he promised that there would come a day when God would make a new covenant with the house of Israel. He says in verse 33, This shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God, and they shall be my people. This new covenant 
began at Calvary. It was ratified, and it will go through the church age, through the millennial age, on into eternity. We'll be under this new covenant. Now, let me help you understand something. The subject of the new covenant is not to prove that the church is fulfilling it, but to prove scripturally to the Hebrews that their old covenant was only temporary, and he takes them back to Jeremiah to show them. He says, folks, you, Hebrews, listen, that covenant was never meant to be permanent. It was temporary. Jeremiah told us that God would make a new covenant with Israel when Messiah comes. So don't hang on to the old, embrace the new. Remember, that's the whole theme of Hebrews, is these Jewish believers, sorrowful that they had to leave behind all the trappings of their Jewish religion to embrace the new Christianity in Christ. Then thirdly, it is an important covenant, as we see in verses 9 through 12. Let me quickly go over these. Number one, it's mindful. The people said we will in the old covenant. Hey, in the new covenant, it's God saying I will. It's not we will, it's God saying I will. We cannot, Jesus can. It's meaningful. After those days, that the Jeremiah prophecy is to be fulfilled. And on into the millennial age, God will engrave his word upon our hearts and minds. External law can control people. It cannot change people. Stealing is illegal, right? You know that? We take the thief and put him in jail. Are we doing that to help him? No, we're punishing him. Now, there are some attempts at reform in jail, but he's really there to be punished. And if he gets out of jail, what does he do? He steals again because he's a thief. The law and the prison system do not make him a new man. Only Jesus Christ can change a man's nature and transform him he can take a thief hey wasn't there one on a cross beside him there was a thief beside him wasn't there? hey jesus can take a thief and transform him and make him a new man a new creature in christ jesus it is memorable the old covenant was rudimentary it was adapted to a people still in the kindergarten of God's school. But in the new covenant, we have a teacher living in us. Hey, you have the Holy Spirit of God who teaches you all things. He is on the job all the time. And it is merciful. It is a covenant based upon the full final solution of the sin question. Jesus on Calvary put away our sin. Then notice, lastly, it is an implemented covenant. I'm going to help your vocabulary now. Two things I want you to see here in closing. An implemented covenant, first of all, we see the soteriological aspect of the covenant. You see that big word? Learn that and throw that around tomorrow at work. Say, man, I learned about the soteriological aspect of the covenant yesterday in church. Say, what in the world is that about? Soterion is the Greek word for salvation. So this is just referring to the theology dealing with salvation. So I could have said the salvation aspect, but it wouldn't have been as impressive. Amen? Under this covenant, the blood was shed at Calvary. And we are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb 
And through this covenant, we have salvation. The bloodshed was required for this new covenant. Jesus shed his blood. He took his blood to the true tabernacle in heaven. He went into the holy place, the holy of holies. He sprinkled that blood on the mercy seat in heaven. And folks, that ratified this covenant that God has made with us, and we are saved as a result. Now, before the Lord went to Calvary, we just celebrated the Lord's Supper, didn't we? We read how he took the disciples aside and they celebrated the Passover. Then after they were done with that, he took two elements of the Passover and he instituted what he called the Lord's Supper. He took the cup and the unleavened bread. There were other things involved in the Passover. There was a lamb and bitter herbs and such things. Only two things were taken from Passover. The unleavened bread, the cup, the fruit of the vine. Jesus said, with these two, I'm going to institute a new memorial supper. This will be for my church. Old things are passed away, behold, all things are new. The unleavened bread represents what? The sinless body of Jesus Christ, which was broken on the cross. The fruit of the vine, the cup, represents his blood that was shed on the cross he says in Luke twenty two twenty, he took that cup and gave it to his disciples and he said this cup is the new what testament the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you that does not just apply to Israel because the Apostle Paul quoted that to a Gentile church and said, this is for you too. So the Gentile church has been brought into this. That brings us to our next big word, the eschatological aspect of the covenant. You know what eschatology is, right? It's what we've been doing for the last few Sundays. That's the study of the end times. Now you go to work tomorrow and say, boy, we had a great sermon yesterday on eschatology. And then just walk away. Eschatology, study of the end times, study of the last day. Now there's that aspect to this covenant. Because it, it's pointing to the, the second coming of Christ. When he will return and Christ will finally be received by Israel. Go to Romans chapter 11 with me. In Romans chapter 11, he, Paul is talking about Israel and the church. There's a lot of confusion today about this. What was meant for Israel, what was meant for the church. Some today are trying to take promises to Israel and try to apply them to the church. That doesn't work. In Romans chapter 11, look at verse 17. And if some of the branches be broken off, he's talking about Israel, the olive tree. He said, thou being a wild olive tree, talking about the Gentiles, the Romans were Gentiles. He's talking to a Roman church. He's saying, you as a wild olive tree were grafted in among them and with them partake of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Israel's the olive tree. It has not been destroyed. The Gentiles were grafted in to that, to be a part of it. Now, basically, the church today is a Gentile church. There are some Jews that have been saved in parts of the churches, and more and more Jews are getting saved, thank God. But how can God promise these blessings to Israel and then give them to Gentile churches? How does that work? Is the church a spiritual Israel? No. That's, there's not a replacement theology here. Here's the solution. Go to Acts chapter 3 and I'll be finished. Acts chapter 3. Peter speaks of something. Christ and the other disciples had talked about 
taking the gospel to the Jew first. Have you heard that? To the Jew first. Jesus went to the house of Israel first. He sent his apostles to the Jews first. Go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, then to the uttermost parts of the world, but to the Jew first, right? In Romans chapter 11, or excuse me, Acts, I'm in the wrong place, Acts 3.25, look at this. Peter says, ye are the children of the prophets, and of the covenant, here we go, and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, you Jews first, God having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from his iniquity. Now what he's saying is, Jesus came to you first, you Jews, Israel. But what did you do? You rejected. You rejected him as your Messiah. Lo, we have turned to the Gentiles. And the gospel, from that point on, was basically taken to the Gentile people who many embraced and accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. When Jesus comes in glory, he will come to redeem Israel, and he will come to implement this new covenant to this nation. When they enter into the millennial kingdom, it will be under the stipulation of this new covenant. We enjoy the spiritual aspects of it. It is not to us Gentiles to receive the land grant that God's going to give to Israel. There are certain things that God promised only to Israel that they will enjoy during the millennial kingdom. But we get to enjoy the spiritual aspect of salvation, redemption, and forgiveness of sin. So Hebrews chapter 8 is making full use of the new in Jeremiah's prophecy that what we have in the new covenant is better and perfect for all we need. Now the question tonight is, where are you? Are you under that new covenant? Only if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you've not trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're outside. You're on the outside. You're without hope. And if you die in that condition, you die without hope. You'll be cast out forever. So make sure that you're counted among God's people. If you've not done so tonight, we encourage you to come trusting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior.